Welcome back to our Art Path Artist Talk series for this summer. My name is Sabrin Stevens. I'm the Education Coordinator at the Lansing Art Gallery and Education Center. Today with me I have Michelle Carlson, our Executive Director, Sarah Hopkins, our Gallery Coordinator, and Cora Ackerson and M. Fisher, who are our Gallery Associates. <laughs> um, the Lansing Art Gallery and Education Center is a nonprofit organization that's been a staple in the Lansing community for over 50 years and has been a leader in public art creation in Lansing for over 13. Art Path, which is in its sixth year, is one of those public art programs. Art Path is the result of the hard work of Katrina Daniels, our exhibitions director, and Emily Stevens of the Lansing Parks and Recreation Department. I'd like to give a special thanks to our site sponsor, Norm Charles, and our title sponsor, MSU Desk Door Fund, as well as those who contributed to the success of Art Path 2022. And now I'll turn the mic over to our artist for today, Jamie Ray John. Ani Buju, hi, hello. I wrote down what I was supposed to say. <laughs> Uh, Ani Buju, hi, hello. Uh, Jamie John Indigena Cause, Makwa Nindodem, Kichuikiwe Rang Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe Aking Nindojaba. And what that means in English is just hi, hello. My name is Jamie John. Um, Jamie John is what I call myself. I am of the Bear Clan. Um, Raymond and Myra John are my grandparents. My mother and my father are Tara John and Arthur Mosqueda. I am from a place now known as Traverse City. I, uh, and I call my tribal nation the people of the Big Bay, but on paper, I appear as a duly enrolled citizen of the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians and the United States of America. Um, I am a multidisciplinary, queer and transgender, Purine American, and Anishinaabe artist living and working on my ancestral and contemporary territories. Um, I have an Anishinaabe mom and a biologic, uh, my biological father is Korean American. Um, while he is not in my life for a couple of reasons, it doesn't really make me sad or make me feel any type of way. Um, my life is more impacted by uh, intergenerational land theft, language loss, and um, even though my life is impacted by those things, um, I have found ways to ground myself in ancestral uh, lineage healing through through these arts, through um, through talking about it, through sharing it. Um, the person I call my my dad or my stepfather. Um, is primarily of Olmec and Nahua descent. Um, when I was between the ages of four and two, I lived with his family out in California in the Central Valley. Um, moving back here to Michigan after some time when my mother's father, my grandfather Raymond, um, got sicker and his health started to decline seriously. Um, he had to be on, I remember him being on, on an oxygen machine um, I spent a lot of time with him, and while he is not, and he passed away when I was about six years old, I still have very palpable, uh, very real, tangible memories of from him, um, and the and the role that he played in my life. Um, I was that's when I I started to do art pretty seriously, pretty much uh, every day, all the time. Um, is when he when he passed away. My grandfather was an artist in his own right, a bead worker, a drawer, a painter. Um, when he was healthy, um, but I I was six years old and I was grieving my my best friend, my grandfather, um, my my most recent ancestor. Um, and the Traverse City District Library offered a offered a gardening and uh, like arts therapy class for aimed at young kids uh, who were grieving someone close to them in their lives. Um, but Barbara McIntyre was the teacher there. Um, I like to credit my teachers. That's usually how we we work in Indigenous societies. Is we credit our teachers. We credit where our stories came from. Um, and we, we credit our elders. 
Um, just as I introduced myself as myself, my grandparents, and my, my parents. Because um, it's not, it's never just me standing here. It's my, my community and everyone who taught me that's standing here as well. Uh, but Barbara McIntyre was instrumental in allowing me to have a tangible understanding of grief. Um, and grief is something that punctuates indigenous life over and over again. Um, through boarding school loss, through land loss, through treaties, through language, um, through ancestry, through intergenerational traumas. Um, and this gardening aspect allowed um, this land-based form of connection through plants, through relationships with soil, through relationships with gardening and, and food. Um, I'm drawn to mediums like printmaking, uh, specifically relief like carving, uh, watercolor, painting, scenes, poetry, filmmaking. Um, I'm deeply inspired and want to be around this sort of like DIY, like riot girl sort of energy. Um, I am very drawn to this like radical anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist mode of making. And, and being that I believe is still deeply attached to my, to a culture of indigenous resistance, to a culture of um, land-based resistance in both the, the Korean Peninsula and both on the continent of America. Um, and I want to, in this case, I want to, this is one of the only ways that I've been able to have a relationship with that Korean lineage or that Korean culture. Uh, without having any Korean, uh, Korean American parents or family that I could really um, learn from or get in touch with. Um, primarily relief printing because it has such a, his a rich history in, in East Asia. Um, you'll find that oftentimes I use rice paper, the Japanese or Korean rice paper. Um, and if you know a little about the Korean Peninsula, you'll know that the land and its people have survived through multiple invasions from neighboring countries um, and a period of Japanese colonialism prior to the Second World War. The history of feet around her eyes that mark her as a little bit of an older lady. Um, and all of the animals that you see here are indigenous to the lands and the waterways the, that we call Michigan. Um, it includes a beaver, a porcupine, a black bear, moose, butterflies, sturgeon, hummingbirds, rusty patch bumblebees, a sandhill crane, bison, dragonflies, a loon, an otter, a frog, a rabbit, 
and you can see the muskrat holding the first patch of earth in his hand that he placed on the back of the gray turtle um, so that we could live on the place that we know as Turtle Island. The mural tells the story of when a sky woman fell through a hole in the stars that was caused by an uprooted tree. Earth was still young at this time. It was covered in water. And sky woman fell through the air and her medicine bag spilled and scattered her seeds, scattered her medicine seeds that became the seeds of strawberries, that became tobacco seeds, corn, squash, beans, cedar. And the first animals to notice her were the birds, and the birds let out a sound to let the water animals know that someone was coming, um, that someone was falling to earth and would need some place to stay, that would need some place to land. Um, the animals that could swim gathered around the great turtle and dove to the bottom to try and retrieve the, the dirt that would grow the new world. At first, the beaver went. He took a big breath, a big breath, and dove down underneath the surface. But be before long, he has to come up back for air. And the loon said, I'm made for the water. I carry the stars on my back. Let me try. I'm sure I could get some dirt in my beak. So the loon dove down and was gone for a long time before he came back up coughing. He said, it's too dark and I can't make it. It's too dark down there and I couldn't see a thing. But there were still more animals who were willing to try as Sky Woman was getting closer and closer and would have to find a place to rest. The otter spoke up. He said, I am the spirit that goes between the water and the land, between the living and the dead, the human and the non-human world. Let me try and retrieve the earth for Sky Woman. Otter took a big breath in his little lungs and disappeared underneath the water, diving down as far as he could swim and swimming with all his might. After a long time of bursting from the water, they heard Otter coughing, struggling to breathe. He said, I can't make it. As powerful and sacred as I am, still I cannot retrieve the earth. I cannot feel or see the bottom where, where it is supposed to be. He coughed and coughed the water up into his mouth and lungs and crawled, the top, crawled on top of the gray turtle. The animals knew that Sky Woman would reach the water soon, and if she could not swim or have a place to rest her body, then she would surely die. The animals looked around to see who else might be able to help Sky Woman when a small voice spoke up and said, I can swim. Let me try. And this small voice belonged to our muskrat. He stood and offered his help to build the new world. Some of the animals were scared from Muskrat, and others laughed at him. But even still, he gathered his strength and asked Kitchi Manitou, the great spirit, to watch over him in his journey. Muskrat took a deep breath, and he disappeared under the water. On top of the great turtle, the animals sat and waited, watching Sky Woman fall through the air and praying for Muskrat to come back. And Muskrat was gone for a long, long time. It was gone for so long, the animals began to wonder if they would ever see their friend again. Just then, the loon and the otter and the beaver noticed the body of Muskrat who had floated to the top. His body, so exhausted from swimming, was so hard for, for, for so hard for so long, his lungs barely breathing, but in his paw, the animals saw a little bit of the earth from the bottom. The rest of the animals rushed over and crowded around his body when the great turtle spoke up and said, Put Muskrat on my back, on the back of my shell. I will carry him, and the earth in his paw will build the new world where Sky Woman will live with live her new life. This land would become what we know as North and Central America. In many stories, the Muskrat dies. In some stories, he stays alive. But in every story, he is underestimated. And in every version I've heard, the Muskrat is the one who brought us the new world. Art of Native and Indigenous people is never just beautiful pictures or sculptures or objects. All of our arts and processes and work tells a story of ourselves, of our cultures and our nations. As much as this image is about, is about Anishinaabe creation, we are also taught that creation is an ongoing act that we are a small part in. This image we see here is about our creation story, the relationships between animals and us, Indigenous women, and, the reflective, and is reflective of our current Michigan ecology and what we lose when pipelines are allowed in our waters, when we allow uranium and coal mines to pollute the air and the sands of the deserts. This is what we lose when our waters are used for fracking, when drill pads are put on top of our burial mounds and sacred sites. This is what we lose when seeds, regalia, canoes, and biscuits are made by our people, by our ancestors, by our families, are stolen, and fr are stolen from us and put behind glass and cataloged in museums and trap indigenous nations in a past that keeps us conquered and powerless. 
This is what we lose to colonial violence that many indigenous nations and people find themselves fighting against in both large and small ways every day. In our story, the muskrat is underestimated, doubted, and faces great odds, but still he sacrifices his only life in order to build the world that he does not get to see. Such is the way of many resistance movements to capitalism, colonialism, and environmental degradation. The ancestors are not distant or forgotten memories. I know this because they are the ones guiding me every day through everything I do. They tell me that now is the time to speak up. They tell me that the world has ended for us, and still we will wake up in the morning and do our sunrise ceremony next to the waters where thousands of us have launched canoes from time and time again to gather the rice that still grows year after year. They tell me to be like the muskrat, that it will be hard and that it will be scary and that you will be doubted and underestimated, but you still must dive into the dark, deep waters of the moon for the new world to be born again. Uh, thank you so much. I've been, I've been changing time. Are we taking, am I taking questions? Okay, that's cool. <laughs> Here, I'll grab this. <laughs> um, I know you talked a little bit about, you know, Michigan and like the surrounding area of like where you grew up, but I was just interested in hearing more about how um, growing up in the Traverse City area, like how that's influenced you as a person and also how it's influenced your work. So there's a pretty deep uh, economic divide between um, black indigenous pers uh, people of color, especially creatives of color, um, and the the people that you know the Traverse City Downtown Commission sort of likes and wants to see. Um, I am. Uh, that's why I sort of am drawn to like this DIY sort of energy, this like institutional, this practice of like institutional critique that sort of um, forces our institutions to change, to consider the future, to consider um, the work that people would be making if we didn't, fa if like Native people didn't face housing insecurity, um, the art we would be making if we didn't, you know, live in a food apartheid. Um, if we didn't um, have to worry about, you know, making rent every month or, or going to ceremony or um, being allowed to do the things that we have always do, uh, we have always done. Um, I think I sort of, I didn't want to give into like this pan Indianism sort of idea of art. I wanted to do art that was sort of specific to lived experience, that was specific to um, Anishinaabe people. Um, even if it was through what, you know, what many would consider like non-traditional mediums. Um, traditional meaning like cool work or beads or, or basketry. Um, and that's not like a put down to artists who do that because they're so they're so lovely and they're amazing and that craftsmanship is is lifelong. Um, I I think that this is the best way for me to get my our stories out, Ashabi stories out, my my stories out as well. Um, to have it still be individual and work cross culturally. Um, is and and being like and being forced to be like resourceful coming from like um, sort of the the back end of the economic divide um, that exists in Traverse City um, and you know Leelanau County and then the surrounding like six county area that um, my tribal nation you know makes up on paper um, is the six counties of that peninsula sort of. Um, but being forced to be resourceful, um, relying on lived experience, and um, the drive to tell our stories to a wider public, I think is how growing up in Traverse City and the Peninsula sort of um, drove my art practice. Thank you. Are there any other questions? 
questions? Thanks so much for sharing your story and your beautiful art. It's really impactful. Um, you talk a lot about the stories of your people and your ancestors. Is there a particular one of the stories that most influenced your art? Is this the story or do you have another one that is like your one main guiding light, so to speak? Um, I'm also, uh, along with being an artist, I am also a powwow dancer. Um, both um, Jingle and a Hoop are my, what people would say, categories. Um, but the, I really enjoy the Hoop Dance story, the story of how we got that dance, because it is, um, we know that the Jingle Dress is a healing dance, and that's sort of a wider known story. Um, but the, the hoop dance, you'll have two different ones from the regions that you'll find the dance in. One's a Southwest story, and you'll find a story from the Northern Territories. Um, our story from the Northern Territories is, um, is credited being written down by Basil Johnson. Um, he wrote down a lot of Anishinaabe stories. He was one of the first ones to write them down. Um, not the first one, but one of them, um, uh, but the story, the story starts with uh, a young boy, um, a young boy who really wasn't into like war games, like la lacrosse or like bows and arrows or hunting like other boys were. Um, and he spent a lot of time with plants, with trees, with squirrels, with um, with nuts, um, with berries, um, with medicine plants. Um, and he was made fun of a lot. He was nicknamed the boy that nobody wanted. Um, and he was out in the woods, and he was told through, um, I believe it was the, the dogwood tree that told him, or the redwood tree, um, that said, for every plant, every movement that you see in a plant, or every stage in a life cycle that you can capture, um, I want you to take my branches and make a circle with them. And in doing so, you can add to this, this dance that you'll create. Um, and I want you to be able to tell a story through through these circles, through through my uh, through my gift that I'm giving to you of the of the wood um, of this tree, um, and that's what the what the dance does. It's like a storytelling dance, um, which is another reason why I think I've stuck with it so long. Um, I started. I think I started doing dance when I was about seven years old. I'm 22 now. Um, I do it much less and I'm much less good than I was when I was say like 14. Um, but um, I still do it at powwows. Um, it's a it's a dance that's known for like its showmanship and athleticism. Um, but you'll see if you if you watch hoop dancers you'll see flowers, you'll see butterflies, you'll see eagles, you'll see um, worlds being created, you'll see you'll see stories being told. Um, so I think that story of, of the young boy that nobody wanted um, is really one that I keep coming back to a lot. Thank you so much, Jamie. And um, I want to say thank you again to our site sponsor, Norm, and then, no, yeah, Norm Charles, and then MSU Desk Drawer, Drawer Fund for being our title sponsor for Art Path this year. Thank you for everybody who came out tonight. And our next talk will be on July 6th. It'll be right across the river, and it'll be Trevor Grable, and that'll be at 6 p.m. as well. Have a good night. Class, class. Oh, yes. If you are available to, um, Jamie is holding a workshop tonight. It is block printing as storytelling. It'll be at 7.30 at the gallery. You're more than welcome to sign up and join us.